started. I couldn't wait 37 seconds. So it's good to be in God's house uh, as we gather together on this, if you're keeping track, the ninth Sunday uh, after Pentecost. Um, you, you may notice we announced this last week. Uh, one thing that's different that has from the last couple months is the four tables that were up front are no longer here. So during the communion distribution this morning, uh, we'll have you come forward kind of in the way you typically did, uh, half over here, half over here, but just stay spaced out uh, and we will, um, I'll bring the, the bread, the body of Christ. Pastor Luke will bring the, the wine, the blood of Christ, and I'll hand to you. You'll take it out of the, they're spaced out in the, tray uh, as well. And then Pastor Luke will dismiss this half, and then he'll dismiss this half, and that's what we'll do. So, uh, all those thing be, things being said, let's stand, and we begin with the invocation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so, it's, uh, it's really simple, life in the church. It's all about Jesus. Uh, the promise comes to us in and through Christ alone. So we're going to sing that. Is that what we're going to sing now? Yeah. So, sing, uh, Pastor Luke. Now we'll start singing. No. So we sing together uh, in Christ alone.
Simply stated, there is no better place to be than in Christ alone, the place of certainty, the place of protection, the place of hope. We come together as brothers and sisters in Christ this morning, gathered together as the Holy Spirit gathers us, and we also confess that apart from Christ, we're not worthy, not worthy to be a part of the family, not worthy to stand before God. We confess our sins. So we continue with the confession of sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, we lie to ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your name, the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son, Jesus, to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. Your hope and mine is found in Christ alone, the sinless one who gave his life for sinners so that we might be washed clean by his blood. The simple truth is that's the reality in the church to hear that we are a people of grace, people of promise. And so as a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please join me for prayer. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, we know that we don't deserve anything that you give us that would be good. We deserve wrath, we deserve punishment, and yet you, by grace, have given us Jesus. You've poured out your Holy Spirit. You provide for all of our needs, not only uh, eternal life, but needs for this life. And so we appreciate and thank you that you've given us your Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit that calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies, that opens our hearts and ears and eyes to receive and give thanks for all the good things that you give. And we pray that as that Spirit leads us, that we would be your obedient children. We pray these things in and through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. The Old Testament reading for today comes from Isaiah chapter 55. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread? and your labor for that which does not satisfy. Listen diligently to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me, here, that your soul may live. And I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. Behold, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples, Behold, you shall call a nation that you do not know, and a nation that did not know shall run to you. Because of the Lord your God and of the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle lesson is from Romans chapter 9 and is, has been the case this summer. will also be the basis for this morning's sermon. St. Paul writes, I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. 
My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ who is God over all. Blessed forever. Amen. But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. And not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring, but through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said, about this time next year I will return and Sarah shall have a son. And not only so, But also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of his call. She was told, the younger will serve the older, as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. This is the word of the Lord. I invite you to stand now as we honor the words of Christ in the Holy Gospel lesson. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 14th chapter. Now, when Jesus heard about the death of John, John the Baptist, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd. And he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Now, when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, We have only five loaves here and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass, and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied, and they took up twelve baskets full of the broken pieces left over. And those who ate were about five thousand men, besides women and children. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I have here a book called the Bible Promise Book, and it has various uh, topics and issues that You can look up, and with each topic are various Bible passages that would correspond with it. So if I glance at the table of contents, there are issues like anger and children and worry and hope and shame and forgiveness, all sorts of things like this. And so if I need to hear God's word about any one of these particular issues, I can jump to that section and read a handful of passages that speak to that. For example... If I'm struggling with worry or anxiety, I can go to the worry section and read passages like 1 Peter 5, 7. Cast all your anxieties on God because he cares for you. So a book or resource like this is a quick and easy way to find a passage that speaks directly to you concerning any particular topic. If you're worried or anxious, though, the last thing you'd want to do is open up your Bible and maybe randomly stumble across something like Acts 5 where God kills Ananias and Sapphira for lying to the Holy Spirit. Or maybe running into 2 Kings 2, where God sends two bears to kill 42 teenagers for mocking the prophet Elisha. Now he's worrying. 
But reading passages like this probably wouldn't help with your worrying. It's a bit safer to find a pre-selected verse and read from there. <clears throat> so while using a book like this or Googling Bible passages for a given topic can certainly be helpful, I know it's helped me a lot bringing me comfort or peace in various situations. There is a danger in reading the Bible only in one or two verse snippets. In other words, plucking Bible verse Plucking Bible verses out of their context misses the bigger, deeper, and richer story of God's Word. When I was in college and seminary, one of the biggest mistakes one could make in in these classes was misinterpreting a Bible passage by taking it out of its context. That is, completely removing it from the verses and chapters surrounding it, removing it from the rest of the book it's found in, and ultimately removing it from the overall narrative of the entire Bible. Again, not that reading one or two specific Bible verses is wrong. It's a good thing to do. It's just that when we only read Bible verses in this way, we can easily end up twisting God's word. If I pluck a verse out of its context, I can easily begin to make it say, whatever I want it to say, rather than what God is saying. We then become the arbiters of God's word rather than God. We fashion God's word into our own image, twisting it to say what we want it to say. This is, of course, nothing new. All the way back in Genesis 3, Satan twisted what God had told Adam and Eve. Did God really say God's word has always been twisted into saying things God never intended it to say. But perhaps less drastically, when we approach the Bible by only reading a verse or two without paying paying any attention to God's wider story, we actually, in a way, remove ourselves from God's story. All of Scripture is one story, one narrative. It's one cohesive unit that tells God's story of salvation. Furthermore, the Bible tells us about God's people and how God has brought them into his story. Christianity isn't just a private religion. It's not just me and Jesus. And God's word isn't just something we only turn to when we're feeling bad or need God to bail us out of something. We don't bring God into our personal lives by reading a few Bible verses here and there. Rather, God has brought us into his story. As we've been working through Romans this summer, we've we've seen how Paul is turning our attention to God's greater story. And in his greater story, God is the main character, not us. But, But we have become a part of this story. And today we're going to see how God's greater story involves a greater people, God's greater people. While God is certainly present with individual persons, especially when a person reads a comforting Bible passage about worry or guilt or shame, God's story is much greater than all of that. Dr. David Schmidt states, God has come in Jesus Christ not only to save you and each person in the entire creation, but also to join you to a people, a people who live by his promise and for his purpose in his kingdom. This is what the Apostle Paul reveals in our text, and this is what God calls us to rejoice in today. So turning to our text from Romans 9, given what precedes it in Romans 8, it may feel a little strange. Romans 8, of course, is full of wonderful passages. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. And then the chapter wraps up with these amazing words. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation 
will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. As far as chapters in the Bible go, Romans 8 is probably one of the more important chapters in all of Scripture. The lectionary spends three weeks on this one chapter, and it's certainly one of my own personal favorites. But as I've been saying, you shouldn't disconnect Romans 8 from its context. And you can't separate it from what follows in chapter 9. So Paul continues. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit. That I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from, from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. So what is Paul talking about here? It feels like Paul went from a joyful preacher of the gospel in chapter 8 to some sort of gloomy gust in chapter 9. Well, geez, Paul, get it together, man. Can't you just stay joyful? Well, this is what Paul is actually getting at. He knows the joy he's received from God, that there is no condemnation of him because he belongs to Christ, that his current suffering isn't worth comparing to his future glory, and that God is working all things in Paul's life for his good, and that nothing can separate him from Christ. Paul joyfully clings to the promises Christ has given him and all Christians. Paul trusts that Christ really has made him one of God's people. Paul recognizes that Jesus has brought him, the chief of sinners, into God's greater story. Paul knows and believes all of this. What's troubling Paul is that most of his people, the Jews, the Israelites, have rejected Christ as the Messiah. In doing so, most of his kinsmen, most of his Jewish brothers and sisters, have rejected God's promises. They've separated themselves from the love and joy found in Christ. They've refused to be part of God's greater story. They've refused to be God's greater people. And this breaks Paul's heart. What we have here in the first part of Romans chapter 9 is a deeply personal prayer from Paul concerning this issue. Have you ever earnestly prayed over a family member or friend who doesn't believe in Jesus? Has your heart been broken over a family member or friend or someone you deeply care about, about walking away from the faith? Have you lifted up painful prayers on behalf of that person? Well, this, this is what we're seeing with Paul here. He's sharing with us his sorrow and anguish over the Jewish people that have rejected Jesus. He wishes that he could swap places with, with them, that he would be cursed and cut off from Christ rather than those he cares for. A rather Christ-like attitude on Paul's part. And Paul lists God's gifts given first to the Israelites that his people are now rejecting. Adoption, glory, the covenants, the law, worship, the promises, the patriarchs, and ultimately Christ. All of these things are found in God's story, and they all pertain to his promises of forgiveness, life, and salvation. But most of Paul's own people have rejected all of these things, even though they were given specifically to them. It'd be like rejecting a personal gift, or a vast inheritance, or even a marriage proposal and wedding ring, but on a much grander scale. The Jews, Paul's people, rejected their identity as God's greater people and rejected their place in God's greater story. And so we encounter Paul's very personal and painful prayer here. In praying for the Jews, notice 
that Paul's prayer is wrapped up in the larger story of God. Paul connects his prayer to God's story of salvation. What's more, he's connecting his hearers, connecting us, to God's story of salvation. Paul states, But it is not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. And not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the are counted as offspring. Paul's arguing here that God gave his promises to Abraham and Isaac and all their descendants, making them his people, making them people of God's promises. God laid out these promises to Abraham in Genesis 12 and 15. And even though these promises included things like many descendants, a land inheritance, and so on, all of these promises were ultimately connected to the promise of a Savior, the sending of the Messiah, to save people from sin and death, which God has already promised in Genesis 3. So God gave the promise of salvation to Abraham and his children. Abraham and his descendants had been made God's people and brought into God's story. However, even though God gave these promises to a specific group of people, the Israelites, Paul's arguing that being biologically Jewish doesn't automatically make you a part of God's people or God's story. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. Jesus made the same argument in the Gospels, and many of the prophets in the Old Testament also made the same argument. And conversely, Paul's also arguing that there are those who aren't biologically Jewish, but nevertheless belong to God's people. It is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. Again, Jesus also made the same argument as did the Old Testament prophets before them, before him. In other words, God's people, the true Israel, are not those biologically descended from Abraham, but those whom God has given the gift of faith. Those who believe in Jesus are truly the people of Israel. God gave his specific promises to Abraham and the people of Israel not to exclude others, but he gave it to this specific people in order that others might also become God's people. God chose a specific people to give his promises of of salvation in order that through them would come the Messiah, and that through him these promises might be given to all people. Dr. Schmidt states, God has chosen Abraham to be the father of his people, and from Abraham, God has chosen to bless not only his people, but all nations on the face of the earth. From Abraham and his descendants, according to the flesh, comes Christ, and Christ is the one in whom Israel and all nations of the earth are blessed. Paul knows this greater story of God, and this story shapes Paul's life and prayer. All who believe in Jesus, regardless of their ancestry, are God's people. The church is the new Israel. That is to say, it's the church that are the people of the promise. We are God's people. He has brought us into his story. So God's story, revealed throughout the entire Bible, is now our story. The promises that God gave to Abraham and his descendants in his story are now our promises. Promises given to you that have been fulfilled by Jesus. Promises proclaiming to you that there is no condemnation of you who belong to Christ. That your current sufferings aren't worth comparing to your future glory. That God is working all things in your life for your good. And that nothing can separate you from Christ. You have been brought into God's greater story. 
God's narrative of salvation is now your narrative. You are people of the promise. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Please rise and we continue now with confessing the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who leads from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. So again, welcome to each and every one of you this morning. If, uh, as we have been doing, if you want to contribute your offering in the box on the way out, that is great. Or you give online, we appreciate that as well. Uh, before we begin the prayer of the church, a few announcements. Uh, our sister in Christ, uh, Eunice Johnson, fell asleep in Jesus on Wednesday, and so her visitation and funeral will be on Tuesday. We also uh, lift up Connie and Doug Hoferkamp and family as uh, Connie's mom, Dot Carol, died this week, and so we pray for hope and comfort uh, for their family as well. So we continue now with the prayer of the church. Let us pray. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, you bid us, you tell us to come to you without money, without anything worthy in and of ourselves, and in and through Jesus, you give us grace beyond price, beyond understanding. And so hear us now as we gather as your dear children this morning, as we come to you in prayer, confident of your promise to hear us and in and through Jesus to answer us. Father, we look for meaning and certainty in all the wrong places, if we just go according to our flesh. And yet we know that you've poured out your Holy Spirit, a Holy Spirit who is at work in this place, interceding with groanings even too deep for words, a Holy Spirit that is at work in calling the church together, gathering it together, sanctifying it, uh, enlightening it through uh, the truth that is Jesus. We rejoice that you continue to grow your church, that in just a bit this morning, that little Abel will be called to be your child through the waters of holy baptism. We thank you that in and through your church, you continue to feed us and nourish us. We pray boldly that you would continue to provide workers for your harvest field, whether that be pastors or teachers, directors of Christian education and parish music and all other positions in your church. We also ask that you would bless those who, continue, who are preparing for those vocations. Father, we also know that we can be distracted, that we can focus on the wrong things. And we pray that you would, by grace, help us to see the areas that you are at work. We rejoice with those who rejoice. And today, with Jeff and Peggy Rohde, give thanks on their 45th wedding anniversary. We celebrate with those who celebrate birthdays and milestones in life as we recognize you as the giver of every good and perfect gift. We thank you that we dwell in this country and pray that you would guide those who lead us in our government, those who are in positions to defend us from our enemies. We pray for our president, Congress, and governor, 
our mayor, judges, and magistrates, that they would discern right from wrong, and that they would lead us with honor and integrity. We know, Father, that you also have sent Jesus, who not only was, but is the great physician, that you dwell with us. As St. Paul says, nothing will separate us. And so we pray that you would be with those who suffer, suffer any kind of ill or affliction. We pray for all those who are on our prayer list, those who mourn for Bill Johnson and family, as we rejoice that Eunice is with those saints who have gone before, with Connie and Doug Hoferkamp and their family, as Connie's mom is with Jesus. We pray for all those who are ill. We pray especially today for Floyd, for Rudy, for Francis, for all those on our prayer list, for those who are fighting cancer, Kathy, Ginny, Rick, Paul, Rebecca, for Maddox, and all those we now name in our hearts. We trust, Father, that you hear and answer those prayers in and through Jesus. We thank you that you have assured us that you are with us and that we can come to your holy altar today to receive Jesus' body and blood in with and under this bread and wine to strengthen us in both body and soul as we know that the day is coming when Jesus will return and all the sad things come untrue. And until then, we know we live by faith as we live by what we hear the truth of the promise that is found in and through Jesus. Father, give us all these things for which we pray, if it be your will, and teach us, and we thank you that you have taught us to pray the prayer Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Please stand for closing prayer. Jesus, we thank you that you are our Messiah. We thank you that you are the proof of the promise that it's not because of what we have done or left undone, but because of you. Because when your Father speaks, things happen. That people are called out of darkness into your marvelous light. That you are present in, with, and under this bread and wine. And we thank you and praise you that you have fed and nourished us in both body and soul. That we are able to come together with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven. That we have had a foretaste of the feast to come. And you strengthen us to live the life you call us to lead now. To follow you in your truth and joy. Bless us uh, today and always as we follow you, Jesus, our Messiah. In whose name we pray. Amen. Receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We close in singing, Build Your Kingdom Here.